So we're gonna go ahead and start this morning. I have something to share with you from, um, from Marlene and Pestalozzi. Pestalozzi, that's what, how she says his name, isn't it? Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with this little comment, a comment from Marlene and, a, and an example from Pestalozzi. We're talking today about nature study. Um, why, mostly, you know, the first time through, we generally talk about the philosophy, you know, the why, the motivation to do these things. And then we talk about methods, tools that we can use to do that. So from Marlene, I want to open this chat with the reminder that what we're engaged in is not something new or something I have made up. It's just that the idea for educating hearts before minds has had a hard time taking hold over the last couple of hundred years. It's been a pretty bumpy road. And then she talks about Pestalozzi and an example that he gave of what he did, because he, he's the one that taught us. He's the one that learned that this method, this pattern of learning is what really truly works for our children and gets these, um, this kind of learning into our hearts, develops a love for the learning, helps children want to learn, want to know more, which is what we're all about as mamas. We just, we want to instill in them that love of learning, that motivation, so that we're not working so hard, we're not fighting against them, we're working with them. So let me continue with what, um, with what she shared about him. Pestalozzi educated by stealth. Now, isn't that what we mamas do? That's what we do. We educate by stealth often. We're much more successful, I think, when we do that. Um, at first, he took several boys and girls of 8, 10, or 12 years of age and had them work with him in the garden. So, so liken this to your daily life. Okay, think about this when I'm reading this to you. They cared for fowls, looked after the sheep, milked the cows, the master, Pestalozzi, worked with them, and as they worked, they talked. Going to and from their duties, Pestalozzi would call their attention to the wild birds and to the flowers, plants, and weeds. They would draw pictures of things, make collections of leaves and flowers, and keep a record of their observations and discoveries. Through keeping these records, we, we call it notebooking, they learned to read and write and acquired the use of simple mathematics. When work, excuse me, when work seemed to become irksome, they would all stop and play games. That's a lesson I could have learned. <laughs> I think that's a really important thing to note because uh, our children often need us to do that. And me, I would, you know, forge ahead, you know, no, we got to keep going until the end, until we drop, you know, instead of taking that time and stop and play games. At other times, they would sit and just talk about what their work happened to suggest. If the weather was unpleasant, there was a shop where they made hoes and rakes and other tools they needed. They also built birdhouses and made simple pieces of furniture. They patched their shoes, mended their clothing, and at times prepared their own food. To his own satisfaction, at least, he proved that children taught by his method surpassed those who were given the regular set courses of instruction. That was huge to me, that example of what he did and that description. You know, if you think about that, you don't have to have chickens or pigs or, or goats, you know, to be able to fit into this model. But if you think about all the variety of things that they did together, about him making um, such an emphasis on learning while they were doing, I think you could draw a lot of comparisons to your own life and your own family rhythm and be able to use this pattern of learning. I'd love to know what you think about these things. What are your thoughts about Pestalozzi's method, how he worked with those children and how those children learned? Do you think that would be successful? Do you have some comments about that? And remember, I take that 30 seconds, let you think about the question that I asked so you have some time to think about it figure out if you have something that you think might might go along with that or another thought that just popped up it popped into your head I like that he said that he teaches with stealth because when you tell your kids okay it's time for 
science, let's go look at birds. Like that does not sound like fun. But if you just start outside and you're excited and you're like, look at that swarm of turkey vultures up there, guys, look at that. What are they doing? What do you think they're looking at? And you get excited, then you get excited. You gotta be sneaky. <laughs> right, exactly. So oh, I, I love it. I love it. And I love that you brought up the turkey vultures. I am so happy every time they come back. I just think they're the coolest things. We have these turkey vultures and we are right in their migration path. And we have huge trees in my neighborhood, in my yard, in my neighbors and across the street. And we are one of the stopping over points for these birds. And so you'll go out on any given evening or morning, early in the morning, and the trees, just these like six trees right around us, our yard and the ones around us are filled with hundreds, literally hundreds of these large, large turkeys. Yeah, right away. And it's just really cool to watch that, to see what they're doing. Anyway, and watch them as they come through every October. There's, they come in huge flocks all at once, kind of, on their way um, down, away from the winter down to the southern climates. And then on their way back around April, they're, they're in much, much more spread out groups. I don't know, they don't get their act together on their return home, but when they're leaving to get away for their summer vacation. That makes sense, right? That's what we do. When it's time to leave our summer vacation and head back home, we're not all super anxious to do it. I guess that makes sense. I love the learning by stealth. I think that's a good way to go, mamas. You don't tell them, you don't announce that that's what you're doing, that you're learning. You just, um, you just sneak that in there. While you're thinking, I'm gonna pull out another book and share something else. But what else do you have to say about that, about Pestalozzi's um, method of teaching children? And of the other, uh, even just the other jobs that they did, the other activities that they were doing. Any other thoughts about that? I'm still learning my stealth mode. You know, just being a first time, this is our first year. And it's been eye-opening not to just forge ahead, like you said, because I've, I'm, a, I'm a scheduler. I work by blocks and it just, that works best for me and it doesn't work best for them. But um, just introducing things to them that's outside of the book and getting outside and it was funny because my son noticed that because we're in the pattern where the blue jays come here during the fall because we're in Tennessee so and my son was so excited because he's like I know the seasons are changing because the blue jays are back and he ran outside and immediately filled up the bird feeder so they'd have something to eat and so that's been nice to see and I like how in Polosky, is that how you said it? <laughs> how, Pelosi. Oh, yeah. He, just trying to incorporate normal conversation as learning and normal day to day, even the mundane things they're learning because if they're at school all day long in the physical brick and mortar place, it's they're not learning how to run life and how to, you know, just be around people all day long because they're usually just they're grouped by age. And you're not like that when you're outside of school, you're grouped with everybody. And even in church, you know, I like how when President Nelson um, took the high priest and moved him into the Elders Quorum, because he's like, we need all ages for this learning. That's how the Relief Society runs. And so I like that they're integrating together as far as, well, my two are nine and seven, but they their learning level is pretty much the same when you really look at science and nature and things mm -hmm. like that they one doesn't dominate the other so not much useful information in my comment but I had no, one <laughs> no very useful no I disagree yeah. with you you're very useful that's exactly what we're doing and that's exactly what we're working with is uh, figuring out our own families their learning methods what works and we're learning that oh my goodness actually just teaching our own at home in our own environment, it is a ridiculously simple, but extremely effective way of teaching and learning. And that's a fabulous thing to, to begin to realize. It just makes our lives so much easier when we learn, oh no, this is their, this is where, the, the, this is the best place for them to learn. And what a blessing. And you know, this church-centered, I'm sorry, I always say that wrong, home-centered church, right? has proven to be quite effective for many. Um, Home-centered education is the same way. 
very, very effective. It is the best place. It can't always happen. And so you've got another resource out there. You've got that brick and mortar, you know, that establishment, a place that they can go where they have people who are trained to be able to teach large groups of kiddos. But when you just have them home and they're your own, you can do it in a much more natural, much more um, enjoyable way. But you do have to start with your own heart. So I'm gonna share this next quote with you and, and this is important for us to remember and then we'll talk about this. So it says, go yourself frequently. This is again, nature study. Go yourself frequently into the fields and woods or into the city parks or along the waterfront or in your backyard, you know, wherever you have, where you can get out in nature, anywhere so that you can touch nature directly and look and listen for yourselves. This is you, moms, not your kids. This is you. Go yourself frequently into the fields and woods or into the city parks or along the waterfront, anywhere so that you can touch nature directly and look and listen for yourselves. Don't try to teach what you do not know. Have you tried that? <laughs> it doesn't really work. It kind of flops and you can feel kind of the, the emptiness, the hollowness of it. Um, don't try to teach what you do not know. And there is nothing that you cannot know in this book. That is the book of nature and the world outside. For the lesson to be taught in each chapter is a spiritual lesson, not a number of bare facts. This spiritual lesson you must first learn before you can teach it. You must feel I should say, and a single thoughtful excursion alone into the autumn fields will give you possession of it. So in case you were doing that thing that we like to do as moms and overwhelm ourselves from the very first moment that we hear a thing, <laughs> um, one time, one time, and you'll learn that spiritual lesson. What do you think about that? How do you feel about that? I know you're all being polite. Don't be polite. Share what you're thinking. What do you think about that idea that you can go out into nature and that very first time you're going to learn things that you're going to be able to bring home and share with your kiddos? You have to not be afraid to be a kid out there. You know, um, one of my, oh, I'm, I don't remember exactly where it is. It's it might be You've Got Mail. I love that movie. Um, but in that movie, when she's kind of skipping down the sidewalk at one point, um, I don't know, there's this kind of joyousness in her, in her walk. And, um, and there are tree leaves hanging down. But I don't know if it's that same movie or if it's another one and I've combined them. But you know when you see in a movie, when you see somebody going along and there are tree leaves hanging down and they go and just, you know, hit the reach up to try to hit the leaves as they go past. That is a childlike kind of our response to nature. And I love that. I love any time when you see an adult responding to nature, being that, letting themselves be kind of a kid and not be afraid. How about the movie, I know it's sort of a different thing, but the movie Enchanted, where they're in Central Park, and she just starts singing and people are all interacting and they're singing and they're dancing and they're having this whole moment together. I absolutely love that. When I'm in the kitchen working, often I'll put on the Enchanted soundtrack because it just makes me happy. And that is my favorite part of that movie because I love this idea of all of these people who think they're strangers, but they're not really. Um, they all, we all came from the same place, you know, and they're out there together just celebrating this moment. And I absolutely love it. Um, but the idea of being able to be comfortable, just being yourself and enjoying what's around you, um, is something that we need to learn to be comfortable with. If we do that, that'll be such a blessing to our kiddos. If we learn to have, to go out into nature, we go out and we learn quickly that we're having those spiritual experiences. We are learning those lessons and now we can begin to share them with our children. Um, I, <clears throat> I think it's kind of magical when you go out and you let yourself not be 
I don't know, caught up with being an adult, you know, and being proper or whatever you think, um, being inhibited. But you just go out there and you start looking. Just look around you and find the things that you think could be interesting. Just start there and you'll find something and then you'll have a feeling about that thing and you'll want to naturally share that with your kiddos. And the, um, the trickle down effect of that is huge. This idea of studying nature, which really is observing, right? It's learning to just look and observe and then begin to ask some questions. And then the very next natural step is nature journaling, going out and drawing and recording what you see. And that seems intimidating to a lot of people. But the thing is, the point of that is not to have a beautiful, incredibly talented artistic journal. The, the point of it is to find joy in observing and learning to see more clearly what's out there. I've invited my friend, Lindsay Bunting, um, she and her children have had have some experience with nature journals and I wanted her to share with you a little bit of that and also a little bit Lindsay of your experience last night of just kind of reviewing your journals. I would love to hear about that too. <laughs> yeah, when we got them out last night, we hadn't we haven't nature journal since April, which is so sad. But we got them out. And we're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, I love like they were all going through going which one is my favorite page. So that was fun. Um, and then also, in, like picking a favorite page was nearly impossible because <laughs> he said to share a favorite page. I thought we're not going to be able to do that. But um, Sarah did pick a couple of her favorite pages. She actually did this. We got like started with this through the charter school when they were going to outsiders. They were going to like a little um, school thing twice a week um, called outsiders, and they would just be outside and they they would nature journal as part of the day there. So we were doing it a little bit before that, but that's Sarah's favorite pages come from outsiders. So they took like pumpkins and followed the pumpkin seed as it grew into a pumpkin. So she likes her little pumpkin chart, but it doesn't always have to be super educational either. Um, what's the other one she did? It was her sun. Oh, I liked the sun. She liked her, her whale. Oh, yeah. She, she thought it looked good, but I like the pages where, you know, the memory attached to it is exciting. But, um, oh, another thing I wanted to point out, too, is it doesn't always have to be drawing. Like, she has just part of Sheets wool just taped in there. It's like, you can feel it. Yeah. So they had a chance to get a piece of sheep wool and put that in there. So that's some of hers that she wanted me to share. Now, the little kids... I can't even tell what it is, but they know what it is. <laughs> they love it. So theirs look a lot like this. And then my perfectionist 10-year-old, he didn't really want to show anything because he thought none of them were good enough, but he had copied this out of a book. It's just a boot with a little leaf coming out, but that's what he wanted to share. And then mine. So what I did to make it less intimidating was I would draw, I would do a nature page <laughs> um, for a holiday or something we had seen on a vacation or a book we read. I would draw part of something out of there. So I got started. We went to a class and I did this really funny looking fox. This was like our very first page at a nature journal class and they taught us how to do that because, you know, I needed to learn from a class how to do nature journal. So then like right after that there was Groundhog's Day. So I thought I'll just paint a groundhog. Whoa. And then I put up like a I like doing a poem next to it. So there's a poem about Groundhog's Day called My Shadow. I love that. That's beautiful, Lindsay. Actually the poem's not about Groundhog's Day, but I thought it was cute because it was my shadow. And the kids had memorized it. So we put that one on there. Um but like when we went to Mammoth, we did um we saw like different obsidian, we went to obsidian dome. So I just drew, like I did a piece of obsidian Ooh, and then the basalt good, rock. Mom. And we went to Henry Carl Redwood State Park. So I did a redwood tree. Like anytime we would go on vacation, hold on baby, Santa Cruz, we have like little ocean things. So that's how I kind of started was just doing it based on 
books or vacations. So if that makes it easier than just going out and finding a tree and drawing it, like you don't know what to draw, Mommy, what is um, this? then that kind of helped me. Um, this is a bug. That is a bug. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we have done it where we just pick out like our nature um, books and just find something in there that we think is cool and then you could just like draw a picture of it like that's the caterpillar wow. and turns into the moth. Yeah. So just, I don't know. This that was ours. I'm probably mama. talking too long. Yep. <laughs> no, I um, love it. And they yeah. like it. They like to go do that, right? Yes. No, they love it. We usually just sit, we actually do it inside. We never nature journal outside because it's just too hard for us to get all of our cups of water and the watercolors and all that stuff. Occasionally we've done where we do sketches, but most of the time they'll just take a picture of what they want to go back home in nature journal and we do it inside. So we're not, you know, that's how we do it. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. And that's the thing is that there aren't any hard and fast rules and you need to do it the way that it works for your own family. Yes. So hi, Ruby. Hi. Here's, here's one more I wanted to share just because we have finished reading, um, Jimmy Skunk. Have you guys read the oh. Thornton Burgess books? And so we drew some of the characters. Ah, I'm dropping you. Yeah. Some of the Thornton Burgess characters from the book. So that's, I like to do them from books we read too. And those are great characters. That's really fun to have those characters from the stories. If your kiddos know the stories, you know, to be able to see the characters, that'd be really yeah. fun. Well, last night Max was all excited because he could remember all their names and that was fun. Okay, so speaking of names, um, have any of you, okay, are any of you familiar with, oh man, there was, on the nature study page in Well-Educated Heart, um, there's a story about, what's her first, Opal Whiteley. Have any of you listened to the podcast about Opal Whiteley? Okay, highly recommend that. And um, I will make sure that that goes into the, um, why can't I think right now, into the email, because it is such a beautiful, such a beautiful book. So I was able to get it on Kindle for $1.99. So um, I have really seriously like no budget, but I spent $1.99 and I got this treasure um, on my phone and she is this little girl that they think actually is a french princess but her parents died and she was in the care of a governess she was taken from her governess she was given to this logging family in oregon and that's where she grew up but she had a diary a little journal that she had hidden and kept with her um she had one that her mom had written and one that she had written and then, and then anyway those got taken away from her eventually which is so sad so those books probably exist somewhere but we don't know where they are and then she kept a journal on any kind of pieces of piece of paper that she could find and she kept that for years and had it in this little box and then her um, stepsister one day got mad at her tore it up into a bunch of pieces and um um, Opal gathered up all the pieces, put them back into a, some kind of a place. And years later, when she was trying to publish a book that she had written, the publisher, in trying to get to know this woman who was bringing this book to him, was asking her questions about her life. And he loved everything that she was telling him. And he wanted to know more because um, she's this naturalist. And she had learned by observing just from the time that, her, that she was young, her parents taught her how to observe things out in nature. And then she just, that was a part of her. And so that's what she did her whole life. And then she um, taught nature classes to children so he asked her about her life her journal her records and she told him what had happened and he said but you have the pieces and he paid to have those pieces like sent to to across the country because she'd come from california to the east coast he paid to have those sent to them and then oh, painstakingly over months those pieces of paper were put back together and then her book was written and it's the story of her life and her experiences. And the reason I'm telling you this is because she, she named the animals in her life. Um, and she remembered the um, stories that her parents told her. And she would use the names of a lot of the, um, a lot of the 
the characters from the stories her parents had told her from good literature to name the animals in her lives. So she has a pet turkey and the pet turkey's name is um, Agamemnon Menelaus Adindon. That was her, <laughs> her pet turkey. Um, the, one of the sheeps was Alfric of Canterbury. Um, Anacreon Herodotus was a lamb, a little more little than the other little lamb. Um, Andromeda was a sister hen of Clementine, another hen. I mean, it's just absolutely darling, but magical. Children love to do this. They love to be out in nature. They love to be around animals. They love to name things. They love to make things up. Um, Charlemagne was the name of the most tall tree of all the trees growing in the lane. I mean, it's just absolutely adorable. And the story is the sweetest thing. But as a mama, it'll make you cry because her life is pretty hard. But she is joyous and positive through all of it. She's this darling little girl that you want to just catch up and hug and love and rescue, you know. But she saw the world through these beautiful eyes that her parents had given her. And it helped her to be able to be happy and find the good throughout her life, no matter what was going on. But it was because of her love of nature and of good, rich stories. So my goodness, this story, this little story about Opal Whiteley that you can get for $1.99 on your Kindle, um, just on that Amazon you know, free Kindle app thing, um, it's, it will change your life. It'll change your heart. It'll help you to see how this, this idea of teaching through the heart, how our hearts are the things that need to be touched so that we can truly learn a thing and how that will then um, carry us through the rest of our, of our learning experience. That's the thing that builds that foundation. And then we just have a place now to put everything else, all the other rich and wonderful things that we learn. Okay, sorry, you guys, some of you were writing down stuff. I will include that name of that book and everything in the email also. So if you want to know that, but I just have fallen in love with that little girl. And that's not even her real name. The mom that she was given to, the family she was given to, they had lost a little girl. The little girl's name was Opal Whiteley. So she just, the parents just gave her the name of their deceased daughter. So um, anyway, that's a person I want to meet after this life. Um, is her. <laughs> anyway, um, so any thoughts so far about what we're talking about? Oh, and Kate, um, don't worry. If you guys forget and you're not muted, I'll mute you. That's not it. I, I do it to help you because that happens to me far more than, um, than I wish it did. <laughs> and it's fine. I'd rather have you talking than silent anyway. Um, okay. So, um, I have a comment. Great. <laughs> so something that I have to keep teaching myself, and it was mentioned in how like, as soon as the work becomes something they don't want to do anymore, it's time to play, um, is to not push. <laughs> and I learned that back when they were potty training, I did a couple of push potty trainers. And then I did a don't push at all. And do you want to wear panties or do you not? And like, and the ones who I didn't push did better. And then I learned that with reading. And then I have to learn it with like everything. Like, I don't know why I don't just like. Learn it? So, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Don't push because they'll learn it when they're ready and when they find a use for it or when it touches yeah. their heart. Like when it's theirs, then they'll learn it. But I keep doing the push, 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 push. And then then I have to step back and go, why aren't they learning? Because I'm pushing again, right? Yeah, no, I love that comment. And think about it, how do you learn best? Do you learn when somebody's you know, shoving something down your throat, making you do it? No. I, I have to constantly remind myself that. Yeah. Uh, that's such a good point. I love it. I love it. And the other, the, the other thing is that idea of us just going and doing it. Just go and be busy doing that wonderful thing that you're doing and let your children see you doing it and it will trickle down. It does every time. There might be an issue of timing, you know, that'll take a little bit of time with some personalities. 
um, not as much with others, but it will trickle down. It will affect them and you will see and, uh, and notice that change in their lives. Um, welcome to Ida. Ida, I loved the painting that you posted in Well-Educated Heart. I just absolutely love that you're doing that. You're such a good example for all of us of learning this Well-Educated Heart and then getting out there and doing it. I, I just, I love it. So sorry, called you out there. I don't even know if you're close to your phone, but oh yeah, you are. Okay, good. <laughs> so she posted in Well-Educated Heart and I can't remember, was it um, the the plain well, oh, nursing the baby. All right, then you can stay on black screen for a while. Um, the I don't know if it was Well Educated Heart or the Well Educated Heart LDS one <clears throat> that you posted, but um, but it was absolutely beautiful. She started painting again. She paints. She does the first one, Well Educated Heart. Okay. Um, she paints and she had been kind of hesitant. I don't know if you were here for her discussion about, you know, she kind of hates to get it out because then her kids get into her stuff. And she's, she's decided that she's going to go ahead and do it. And she's just going to start painting and um, got everybody set up with their own supplies and things and, um, and started painting and had a great experience. I love seeing you kids, little kids on there. So that just makes me happy. So it's great Lori yeah <laughs> sorry sorry I no. was like oh, she's, <laughs> she's talking to me um sorry yeah it's been so fun I just want to tell you too like I started I was like okay I'm just gonna do this so I just pulled out all the paints and the kids at first they've been uh <laughs> at first it was crazy but then I was like you know what let's just do this and I got enough paints for everybody and we just pulled them out and all the kids have been loving it and it's been so fun and then they love watching me paint and they're always commenting about it and they want to try the things that I'm trying and we've done and it, you know what I noticed too I you know like when you paint like I think I I heard this in one of the the things about the nature study or whatever you notice the details in things so much more like you you get to know the plants you get to know the trees you notice the fine things beauty of them and it's so uplifting you know and it, it really like it's so cool because you can really and feel it you know like enriching your life and and softening your heart I guess is you know like they say so it's really cool anyways <laughs> that's all I have <laughs> no that's fabulous that is wonderful thanks for sharing that because look this is what you are learning a practical thing you're learning that these principles and truths that you're learning about in the book or on the app are actually true and you're realizing that and seeing that truth in your in your life and in and you're experiencing that in your heart and that's where those messages stick because once you've experienced it in your heart then it's yours and it's also then yours to share with other people and i love that as well um there's a writer that i some mom had um messaged asking for book recommendations for audible books for a trip that they were going on and I brought one up and when I was looking to get some more information about her, I found this write up about this author on National Review. I loved that write up so much that I copied and pasted the whole entire thing and put that in my comment in response to this poor mom who just wanted like some names of some books. <laughs> she had no idea what she was getting into. Put something out there in front of me and you're gonna get way more than you ever asked for. But the author's name is Elizabeth Enright. I highly recommend her. She writes beautiful, beautiful literature for children. And it was early 1900s that she was writing, but she started out as an illustrator. And that's an interesting thing that was pointed out in the very beginning of the article that I did not include. So I guess I didn't include the whole thing, but it said that because she started out as an illustrator, that made her a really good storyteller because she had learned to see things and she was able to paint a more beautiful and complete picture. <laughs> Amy's, Amy's getting lots of love from her kiddos. <laughs> um, but it made her a great storyteller because she was able to see these, the details. And I just absolutely love that. I think that's so true. But Elizabeth Enright writes these stories about children. Like she has, the ones I know about are the Lake series, Gone Away Lake, and I don't remember the other one that goes with that. And then um, it's probably like Return to Gone Away Lake. 
And then the others are, it's a collection of stories about, um, I think it called, they're the Melendi stories, the Melendi children. And, um, and they're just charming anyway, but it's just children that have these incredible, wonderful experiences. And my favorite is the four story mistake, but you ought to go in order. So you learn the, about the family, but the four, four story mistake is magical. I want to live in that house. I want to be in that, that setup of nature. I just absolutely love it. The kids one time they take, uh, like, um, I can't remember, they take some drinks or something and they take them down to the Creek and stick them in the water so that they will be cold or make, you know, and they go and have all this fun play and then go back to where they've stashed all their food. It's kind of um, magical like Farmer Boy is. Do you love Farmer Boy? The Laura Ingalls Wilder book, Farmer Boy, Lindsay is saying yes, yes, yes. Um, how many of you know that book? How many of you are familiar with Farmer Boy? Well, look, I have four faces to look at. The rest of you are black, but um, but that is such a wonderful story. It's the one of Almanzo Wilder and his growing up years. And Oh my goodness. I remember my um, super good friend, um, she's married to my husband's cousin. And so their family that were cousins and our kids were best friends growing up. And one of the times that when she was reading that to her kids, and so she went and bought watermelons and she, they made homemade ice cream and because of one of the chapters of that book. And I thought that was really fun to make that a real life kind of an experience. And that's a thing you can do as a mama is tie in in fact, it's recommended. That's how you get nature study to be really in a child's hearts is if you connect it with literature and poetry. That's why Lindsay, I'm sure, was motivated to put the poems there next to her drawings. That makes a connection to your children's hearts, to your heart, that makes that stick, makes it a lot uh, stronger of a connection. Okay, while you're thinking about what you wanna share, I'm gonna read Ida's comment. My aunt made this comment about painting. I loved painting trees when I was a kid. It made me notice all their differences in beauty. To this day, I still love to look at trees. I thought, yes, exactly. And that's true. That's true. Have you ever gone out and, I mean, do this, just this one thing. Go outside, pick somewhere in your yard, go outside and pick anything, anything that you notice out there. And, but kind of a small section, a small little piece of it and look at and think about what colors from your paint box or your, or your colored pencils would you have to use to paint or to draw just that one little section? How many colors are there? It's amazing. It's amazing. You go to draw a, um, a, a red rose and you're going to use far more colors than the red in your paint box. There are going to be so many other variations and shades and, and completely different colors that you're going to pull out if you want to capture the colors of that rose. It's just incredible. And that's really fun to learn. Just that one thing about color. Lindsay. Bunting. Yeah, I was just going to say one day we decided we'd come out and we'd all draw the pomegranate tree. And so everyone drew it. And we didn't really think about, I don't know, anything that we would look at it later for. We just thought it'd be fun to draw it. So we all drew it. Well, that pomegranate tree is like quadrupled in size. And so it's kind of fun to go back and look at the drawings and realize that the growth that the tree has had. So it's fun to, yeah, to draw things in your garden that are growing and then later go back and look at the difference it's made or a different season. So right now the pomegranate tree is green, but in all of our paintings, it was yellow. So it's kind of fun. Right. No, I love that. I love that you can chronicle, you know, the change, the growth, the development, or the changing seasons, like you said. We have had the blessing in our lives when my kids were growing up of having a beach house that we got to go to during the year because nobody else in the family could go because we were the only ones that were homeschooling our kiddos. And um, so we would go for two or three weeks at a time and we would go different times um, of the year. That was so amazing. I had no idea that the beach looked different in spring and fall and winter from how it looks in summer when you drive out to the beach, you know, for a day at the beach. But just the changes that happen, the way the beach looks, the things that are up on the beach that the ocean has given to you, you know, and then comes and takes back, you know, at nighttime or whatever, when the tide is high. But the, the variety of things that show up on the beach. And we started learning 
oh, these are always here in November. These things are always here in April. Like ladybugs, there's a time of year when ladybugs are have been flying and somehow they've been caught up in the wind and the ladybugs are all over the beach and a lot of them on the on the shore you know they've been caught up and then caught in the water and washed up on the shore there are other times when there are these and i'm not i don't remember what they're called darn it they look like little jellyfish but they're these little blue squishy things that um end up on the sand and my kids could tell you because they learned about it <laughs> mom wasn't as as good a learner i guess but um, but they would be littering the beach and that would be just so amazing and cool to see those. There were other times when the, um, the way that the sand had been built up, you know, the, the ocean comes and strips the sand away and strips the beaches and, and the level of the sand is, is down really low. Um, and the beach looks incredibly different and it exposes all these rocks and things. And we were familiar, you know, we, we, there were things that we knew from the summertime that were different in the wintertime, like in the wintertime, it stripped down. And so we saw all these rocks and these cool tide pools and things that we never knew existed because we had only been there in the summer. Um, and then vice versa, other times of the year, um, right before it gets stripped down, the beach is so high and there are kind of these, we call them cliffs, you know, and they're like this tall, you know, they're not very tall, but the, but the ocean had deposited all this extra sand and then started coming and carving it away. And so you could stand on the very edge of the cliffs and, you know, and make them cave in. And so my kids love to do that, but you would notice these different things about the different seasons because you're out there and you're paying attention and you see what it looks like. And there's something magical about that, about being aware and noticing. So I love, um, what you said, Lindsay Watkins, about the Blue Jays. That's something we don't know. We don't know that the Blue Jays migrate through and that they go through Tennessee. You know, I only know about the ones in California. So that's super cool. And I love that your son is the one who recognized it. That's something that he's noticed. He is noticing patterns in nature. And that's a very scientific thing. And that's something that no book told him but it's something that he learned in his head after his heart experienced it and his heart learned that and told him. I love that. Okay, sorry. I get excited about a topic. So thoughts, mom thoughts, mom experiences, questions. Hey, Lori, I'll say something. Great so when I come Hi, um, I stopped worrying about not knowing the answers to their questions. So when I go out on walks with my kids, because my youngest especially, Rose loves to go hiking and she's oh way into birds right now. So she, on her own, she found an app where we can put in the color, the size, what the bird call sounds like, and then it can tell us what it is. And she figured that all on her own. So I don't worry so much about do I know what the things are because we can ask a lot of questions and then we can go home and research it if we need to, but it's, it's just fun. And I think they like teaching me something and it's completely fine that they know more. I love that. Like, I want to learn. Tell me, tell me more. Great. I love that. And that's so true. And that's so good to have um, an open heart like that as a mama and just be out there exploring with your kids. And you know, honestly, my feeling is if you never know the name of that bird, but every year you love to go out and watch it and you know that it's coming through and you, you know, you've learned something about its habits and things and it's familiar, familiar to you, then that is amazing and wonderful. Like that little girl I was telling you about, Opal Whiteley, she didn't know what kinds of trees or birds or things those were, but she named them and she loved them and they were special to her. Morgan, did you want to share? No, no, no. Okay. No worries. Um, okay. Any other thoughts about that? I, I, we need to be open to those things and experiencing those with our kiddos and just learning to love those things as they are. Um, I was going to mention, have any of you read Girl of the Limberlost, Freckles, Laddie, any of those Gene Stratton Porter books? So good. So good for your mom heart. I loved them. Um, and... Oh, yes. 
Okay, so Ida, you listen to Opal Whiteley. Um, I love it. So the but freckles, girl of the limber limber loss, laddie, paint a beautiful picture. A lot of nature study in there. And oh, okay. And um, what was fun for me when I was li li listening to those books or reading those books is they would describe um, some of the birds and some of the different um, ant creatures that they were running across throughout their lives, just their, a day in the life kind of. And so I would go on to the, on my phone and I would look up that bird and the sound. And so you could get the bird call and you could hear. So, you know, as I'm, he's talking about this, like, you know, cacophony of sounds, you know, all this stuff that was going on and it scared him. He got really nervous because he was out around the lake on, um, going out on his rounds all by himself in the very beginning. And, um, and I wanted to know what were these sounds? What were the things that were causing him to have these kind of, you know, fearful thoughts? And so I looked up the different calls of these different birds and I thought, oh, I've never heard anything like that before. And it was fun and it made it come alive. So don't hesitate to do that either. If you're reading a story, listening to a story, maybe you've got young kids and you're doing um, Thornton Burgess books, um, you can look up online, you know, pictures of that animal you know, the real animal, so they can see that. Um, I'm, I'm like a little kid. I get so excited about this stuff. Just waiting in case anybody has a thought. I feel bad being the only one that's yapping away up here. <clears throat> Anyway, go read those books. I loved them. They were kind of magical to me. I put some poems in the chats um, that I loved that are nature related. I just thought they were beautiful. Uh, one of the things that um, Marlene says over and over again, as she gets to know artists, musicians, wonderful, beautiful writers and storytellers, they spend a lot of time in nature going out and having nature walks, just getting outside was important to them, very significant part of their lives. And I'm sure it helped make them who they, who they were and are. Um, okay, from Lindsay, there's a movie called The Big Year. Um, screen it before you let your kids watch it. It's PG-13 for a few bits of language only. It's an educational movie about birds. Wonderful, wonderful. And I love, um, documentaries. So if you guys have recommendations of documentaries, um, share those too. We use that a lot in homeschool. A lot of times we would make lunch and then we would have a picnic in front of the TV in the family room and we would um, put a, a blanket or a big beach towel down and then we would eat our lunch while we watched a documentary. And that was school. That was fabulous way for them to be learning but not have so much pressure um, about the learning. So that was wonderful. Okay. Any other thoughts on this before I go on? Um, one of the things she says is the objective of nature study, just as a reminder, is pure and simple joy. Well, that's amazing. How great is that? That that's the work that you're doing? That's what you need to, to worry about? Um, are your children absolutely enjoying what they're doing, running around and playing outside? Well, then you're being successful, mom. And I really mean that. I know that seems kind of simple, but it's true. Okay, how about this? I'm gonna share this with you from Helen Keller. One day, Helen Keller, who could neither see nor hear, was visited by a very dear friend who had just returned from a long walk in the woods. She asked her friend what she had seen, to which her friend replied, nothing in particular. Helen exclaimed, I might have been incredulous had I not been accustomed to such responses, for long ago I became convinced that the seeing, those of us who can see, see little. She said, how was it possible, I asked myself, to walk for an hour through the woods and see nothing worthy of note? I, who cannot see, find hundreds of things to interest me through mere touch. I feel the delicate symmetry of a leaf. 
I pass my hand lovingly about the smooth skin of a silver birch or the rough shaggy bark of a pine. I feel the delightful velvety texture of a flower and something of the miracle of nature is revealed to me. At times my heart cries out with longing to see all these things. If I can get so much pleasure from mere touch, how much more beauty must be revealed by sight. Yet those who have eyes apparently see little. The panorama of color and action which fills the world is taken for granted. It is human, perhaps, to appreciate little that which we have and to long for that which we have not. But it is a great pity that in the world of light, the gift of sight is used only as a mere convenience rather than as a means of adding fullness to life. Did that touch your heart? That one has been powerful for me. These books that I got, these are the um, reference library. You know, there's three volumes. Oh my goodness. I, I carve out time in my day to read these books and I have a hard time putting them down and they're marked all over the place. I've got notes and underlinings and stars and hearts and you know, whatever I use to say, this is important. I need to remember this, or I want to share this with all of you. So, but how beautiful. Nature study is not science, it's not fact, it's spirit. It is concerned with the child's or our outlook on the world. And I think the world becomes a much more beautiful place, even with all the crazy, goofy things that are going on out there. Um, the world becomes a much more beautiful place when we um, spend a lot of our time out in nature. Ida, these are the... Um, Catch the Vision of the Well-Educated Heart. There are three volumes. It's, it's new. It's um, all of her podcasts, the Take Fives. It's all of the information that's in the introductory course, just all written out. Um, and in, um, I think that's all that it is. But anyway, it's amazing. It's a wealth of information and for a great price. They're online, of course, for free. I just, I need to make notes and I need to be able to just pull it and look at it like this instead of on my phone. So I, so I actually purchased the, the books. But, um, I can mess, message or include that in the um, email as well. I put things down about um, nature journaling and the three tools for learning and that is I'm gonna forget um, who knows and can help me remember observe uh, Lindsay I know you know but you're trying to know you're trying to remember too okay so hold on I know hold on which book is it in um, oh come on Hang on. That's not that one. It's in the other one. All right. So it's John Muir Laws and he is a naturalist and he is amazing. And he has free classes online where he tells you about nature journaling and he teaches you how to draw. Actually, he has some free, um, some free drawing classes. He tells you about materials that you could get. He even sells some of them, but he just says, you don't need much. Um, okay, I, um, I notice, I notice, I wonder, and that reminds me of, those are the three things. I notice, it's so first you need to see. Oh, I notice, and he tells you pick up a thing or go over to it and look at it. And he tells you, say out loud what you're seeing. Say it, say what you see. And he said, it sounds weird at first. He said, but um, uh, you just do it anyway. You just say what you see. I see a pine cone. I see this pine cone, you know, and it's covered with all these little pokey things on the ends. I didn't know they had pokey things on the ends, or I don't know. You know, it's this color and this color. It came from this tree. Oh, wow. I didn't know those trees had pine. I mean, it's like you start this conversation and then you get yourself sucked into it and you start becoming interested in the thing. I remember when I was taking um, the uh, John Muir Laws, M-U-I-R, like John Muir, and then his last name Laws, L-A-W-S. Sorry, I'm responding to the question, Lindsay's question over there. 
Um, but I'm taking this master gardener class. I, I was, and I, uh, from the county extension office and we're down there and somebody mentioned something about an acorn. They brought in an acorn and I thought acorns. Wow. I didn't, I've never seen an acorn like in real life. How had I not ever noticed or seen an acorn in real life? How had I not picked one up? How had that not been a part of my life? You know, it was kind of, this was like 10 years ago, you know, and and I was thinking, oh, they brought it back from like Tennessee or, you know, Kentucky or something. I don't know what, why, well, I don't know what I was thinking, but I just had this, you know, they said, no, 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 the, the oak tree that's out, you know, right here out by the building, the, that one over there. And then the teacher was saying, when I first started work here, that tree was just a baby, a, a, um, a baby tree, you know, and look in the 35, 45 years, whatever it was, you know, look at how it's grown and whatever. So then we went out as a class and we looked at this oak tree and the acorns that were just on the ground in Bakersfield. <laughs> and it was like, I don't know, but I was so excited about this thing that was new to me and it was so cool. And the acorns, they're so cute. And the little caps, you know, that they have on them and the little, you know, like they were fall decorations that um, fancy moms put out in their house and made, you know, made their houses look all lovely with the pretty little acorns and whatever. Or kids play their little games with the little acorns and their little caps. But anyway, it was this moment for me that I, I was so excited about this new thing that I got to experience and learn more about anyway but that's what happens when you let yourself get out into nature and just be an experience you know so that I notice and then I wonder let yourself go let yourself wonder about the thing and then that reminds me of and you start to make some connections pausing so if you guys want to say something you can I'll say something. Oh, no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, heavens, I have nothing important to say. Yes. Neither do I. <laughs> You're both going to talk, so. <laughs> you go first, please. I was just saying, we moved from Arizona to Tennessee three years ago. And so going from Arizona trees um, in Phoenix. Oh. Just saw that. Going from palm trees. No, they're too too tall to really observe up close but yeah. and then coming out here to Tennessee where there's not a palm tree to be seen and all of we had an egg an oak tree at right underneath right over our trampoline so the kids just were constantly shaking the acorns out and just filling it up so that just made me think of that but it's it's been a discovery for them for sure just getting out and seeing a totally different world I love it I love it. That's awesome. My husband went on his mission to Kentucky and had part of Tennessee and Indiana. And he just said he was amazed at the forests, you know, and the trees that just grew forever, just grew straight up. And then you realize, oh, that's how you get lumber from a tree, not from a California tree. <laughs> it goes like this, you know. But anyway, Ida. I was going to say, you know, I, um, we moved here, to, we live in Texas and we moved here from Washington state and I lived in like Minnesota and Idaho and Utah and anyways so we moved to Texas my kids grew up in Washington state and they you know there's so much so much different different so many different things about nature here than Washington I mean the dirt the trees the animals everything right and um it's they're constantly outside exploring and learning about all the different animals and creatures and whatever you know and so funny. So my little nieces come over and they play with my my boys and stuff, and they catch little salamanders or I don't know. They they caught these things called skinks, right? <clears throat> it's like a little lizard of some sort. <laughs> I know less about it than they do. <laughs> anyway, so my brother tells me they're going on a trip, and he they're at this rest stop, and his his daughter says to him, "Dad." Uh, Sam, Sam has lot, they have lots of skanks at their house. <laughs> all, over the, all over the place. <laughs> and my brother's like, what? <laughs> yeah, lots of skanks. Sam, Sam catches them. <laughs> what do you do with them? Oh, we put them in a bucket and keep them. 
anyway, so he had to send me this message about the because and, and it's just it was it's just a funny story, but also like it's so interesting because like they're learning these things and they're so excited about them and they're sharing them. And I think that's what like uh I think um Marlene, she says that a lot, you know, like story you're like sharing stories, right? So the the greatest way to actually learn something and, and like incorporate it in your life is when you're able to share it with other people and so that it becomes part of you, you know, like that's the thing that you keep. And so all these little awesome things that you're learning and the kids are learning it, it's I was like, yes, they're learning these things. They know them because they're able to share them with other people and tell them about this stuff. And so even though sometimes it's like, oh, you know, they're running around and playing and they're not doing anything really productive. But at the same time, they are learning so much. And I'm like, okay, remember, remember this. <laughs> but yeah. So, I love it. I love it. And play is the best way to learn. And it really is. And, you know, sometimes we feel guilty as a mom because we don't have anything to show another person and to, to measure, right? But that's that mind learning. The mind learning can be measured. Heart learning, it, you, you don't measure it in that same way. And so you don't necessarily have the kind of thing that a person is used to having as proof of learning. You know, we gotta have proof. We gotta show that our kids are learning. Oh my goodness, mamas, your kids are learning so much more. And in the right kind of environment and the way that it, that it gets into their hearts so that it will stay with them forever and ever and ever. I absolutely love this. I was telling Lindsay last night that as I'm going through and studying all these things for these meetings, it's so much for me and for my heart. But the thing that's really exciting is, um, you know, cause I had said, I didn't have this when I was t learning, teaching my kids and learning with my children. Um, I didn't know about Marlene or I hadn't, you know, gone to respond when friends had told me about well-educated heart. And at first I felt bad about that because I thought, oh my goodness, look at these rich resources and everything that I've missed out on. But at, the more that I learn and the more that I read from her, I'm finding that, oh, I have that book in my library. Oh, I learned about that person. Oh, we use that and we did that. And that's because all throughout my learning experience with my kiddos, I prayed. I asked Heavenly Father for help and direction the whole entire way. So he directed our learning. So what do you know? You know, the learning that we experienced directed by Heavenly Father lines up with well-educated heart learning. That makes sense. Marlene's been inspired to do what she's done and to put all of this out here for us moms. All moms, you know, non-denominational, it doesn't have to be just, you know, LDS moms. It's for any moms and any women out there. This learning, this heart learning, I would share this resource. I do share this with all the women that I know because this is the way that we are going to have an impact on this world is by learning ourselves the things that truly matter and softening our hearts through music, poetry, art, storytelling, and getting out in nature. That does create that heart softening that we need to be able to receive inspiration, to be able to hear him, to follow the direction that we're receiving all women on this earth, to follow that direction and to start influencing others for good, being that good, being that heart for those around you, helping others to see and feel the Savior's love in their lives. That's what we're here to do. And part of that is teaching our kiddos. But when we're keeping that eternal perspective, that wide long range goal, we're thinking about our influence, our impact, theirs, not about college, not about jobs. That's not the end. That's not why we're training them. That's not the focus. It's everything that they're going to, going to go out and do in this beautiful, amazing, wonderful world. When we include nature study as one of our foundations, then we, um, we really have built a strong foundation from which to grow and move forward. And we are able to combat all the negative that's out there in the world. We just don't feel it as much when we have all of the things that are there because of nature, the things that, that studying and being out in nature bring to our hearts. You know, same thing with all of that, the storytelling, the art, the poetry, the music, Make sure that you have a good, healthy dose of those. Make sure that those are really 
what you spend your time doing during the day and your day will be so much better, so much lighter. You'll be directed as to the things that are most important. You'll be directed as to the things that you can let kind of fall by the side. Like I've mentioned, this past six months has been a gift, an incredible gift to help us to kind of filter out those things that we don't need and put in and focus on the things that are most important. And now we have a job ahead of us as things start to open back up and, and um, things start to vie for your attention. You need to decide, are they on that list? Are they on that list of the most essential? You know, that word essential is not a bad word. Um, it's important for us to realize what is essential for us and for our children in the long term, that eternal perspective. So, and I think nature study is a great, big, huge part of that. So I will include a lot of things in the email this week. I will do that soon. We'll also upload this, the recording of this soon so that you have access to it. You can share it with your friends. Um, not that my part on, in this is anything significant at all. My whole goal is to direct you to well-educated heart. That's what I want for you because that's where the resources and everything are. What we're doing here is this Mothers of Influence group. We're meeting together, sharing what we're learning, and then hopefully going out and influencing others and sharing what we have with others.